Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. Together, we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics, whatever those might be. And Cherry, I think, has a topic for us today. Yay! Which she's holding very precariously on her iPad. That's not in the case. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope she doesn't drop it. It's a carpet. Uh, I guess it's carpeted true. It's a carpet. floor. This is a wood fine. table as well, Cherry. Yeah, so. we'll be okay. Today, we're going to talk about. Elections in China. Wow, Cherry. I've heard on the internet that China actually is the has the most free elections. Mm. I've world. heard of that too. Yeah. So this is going to be a <laughs> two part series. In today's episode, we're going to cover the history of elections in China. <laughs> See, you, don't, you don't have any. You don't have any patience for my uh, no. <laughs> my tanky jokes. <laughs> no. Okay. So we're going to cover the history of elections in China before 1949. Okay. Okay. The natural. Division line between in, when China uh, stood up. <laughs> yes, liberated. So the book that inspired this episode and is also where a lot of the historical facts in this episode are referenced from、mm. is "Voting as a Right: A History of Elections in Modern China" by Joshua Hill,、okay. and we highly recommend it.、Mm. Well, I highly recommend it. I haven't read it, it yet, but.、Yeah. Well, I represent us. Cherry, cherry, <laughs> cherry recommends it on the podcast. I'll be elected to、yeah, represent、true. us on this. Cherry is the people's representative、yes. of this podcast. Yeah, and to be honest, Natalie wanted to do this episode for a while now. Yeah, but one of the things that really triggered it for me is that recently there was a study published by the Denmark-based Alliance of Democracies Foundation and German-based Latana data tracking firm. So it's called. A democracy perception index report, a DPI report. Wow! It is supposedly the world's largest annual study on democracy. Okay. And they monitor attitudes towards democracy from around the world. And this year, 2022's study, published in May, collected public opinions of democracies amongst five, fifty. Fifty-two thousand seven hundred something respondents across fifty-three nations and territories. Cherry always has difficulty when she sees long numbers because China, you basically go off thousands. Yeah. Instead of it's four digits、yeah. rather than a three-digit system.、Um, but you know, I can edit those out. And now it's like <laughs> now I seem incompetent when I no, read numbers. No, this is cultural. We're talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> cultural issues, Cherry. So my my point is. Fifty-two thousand something people across fifty-three nations.、Oh. I don't know how big of a sample is that. I also don't do polling, or or I'm not a statistics <laughs> expert. A you know, a statistician. A statistician. You、yeah. know, and I'm not. I don't, I don't have much. We'll just assume it's、sampling. good enough. We'll assume it's good. I don't know. So well, let's not insult the good people at the Denmark、sure. Institute. Well, then this will be. I need to <laughs> <laughs> got to edit part of the <laughs> <laughs> edit out some some things I wrote. So the data they have collected might raise some eyebrows. Okay, certainly raised mine. For example, one of the first stats from the study is that the country is considered most democratic by their citizens. Number one on the list. Care to guess? China. China, <laughs> and it just had a little asterisk next to the to this finding,、mm. and it, the asterisk said, "quote In some countries surveyed, the government plays an active role in shaping public opinion, and or has policies in place that restrict freedom of speech around certain topics. This can have a strong <laughs> influence on the survey results." <laughs> "quote So you know." <laughs> Well, the, Ooh, strong language. Well, Let's not accuse those governments of dictatorships. Well, the interesting thing is to me, though, yeah, is I wouldn't necessarily know what the Chinese government would want me to put on a survey like that, because on the one hand, the Chinese government <laughs> says democracy is bad. Sometimes they、I、do. Yeah. yeah, we're not ready for <laughs> democracy. <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily know that that's the correct response to say we're a democracy. No, I think you will say yes. We are when you are asked. Okay. I think you would just understand it as democracy was Chinese characteristics.、Mm. Yeah. Anyways, so you know, I wasn't traditional、happy. Chinese medicine, <laughs> traditional Chinese democracy. Yeah. So I wasn't happy about that. But <laughs> <laughs> more fittingly, though, they also measure the difference between how important people say democracy is and how much democracy think, like how democratic they think their country is.、Mm. And the difference, this number is called the perceived. 
democratic deficit. Mm. The PDD, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> guess which country has the smallest deficit? Also China. Also China. <laughs> <laughs> When eighty three percent of the Chinese people surveyed, I mean, also they, I guess they specify like it's like people live in China, but you know, yeah, eighty three percent of those people said democracy is very important, and ninety one percent said China is democratic. So you know, <laughs> China is doing really well. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and you know, move over India, world's largest democracy. Nothing to complain about. China, the Chinese government is very much living up to the democratic <laughs> expectations of my people. Yeah, of well, the Chinese people. It, it's not over yet. Okay. I, I know this. I told you this is going to be a r- r- ranting episode. Let's hear it. Let's go yeah. for it. Warning for our listeners. <laughs> Lots of ranting coming up. When asked about desires for more democracy, I mean, they're ninety one percent sure. How much more democracy <laughs> can you get? <laughs> I know, but when they ask this specific question,、okay. do you think your country needs more democracy? Yeah, China and South Korea had the least people who said not enough. We want more. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the service done by the internet, so it's not like just you drag someone on the street and、oh, ask、okay. them because so then there's a hard record. So I will only be more cautious about what I say. Yeah, you know, digital ink and all that. Anyways, China and South Korea. I will give it to South Korea. I think they have a very dynamic democracy, <laughs> very active, very angry, very angry. Yeah, I'm not happy about who they elect. The most recent incel president. Yeah. I'm so, hopefully I'm not offending any South Koreans. Yeah. But but you know at least they have a democracy. China's like we have the best democracy. Yeah. It's very important to us. We have exactly the, the correct、right、amount. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And and for Natalie, the red-blooded American, you want to know how many people in America said there is not enough democracy? Oh God,、uh, that there's not enough. Yeah. See, I don't know. That I, they were complaining there needs to be more. Like ninety percent. Well, okay. <laughs> See, I can't play this game with you <laughs> because whenever I play a game, guess how much? Like Natalie's always comes with like an insane number. The the U.S. is actually one of the most. Uh-huh. Directly democratic, like places in the world, like most countries. Not according to these Americans. I know, but most countries, people just don't. <laughs> most countries don't even get to elect their own representatives. Like they just pick, they just vote for seats at a parliament. I know. Well, in the United States, forty-five percent of the people surveyed said that there is not enough democracy. Okay. So forty-five percent of America supposedly goes more democracy, please. And then there's, then there's say, the other forty-five percent is a too much democracy. Yeah. <laughs> For certain people, yeah. For certain shades of people, yeah. Perhaps. And let's just say Americans are always angry, and they always want more、yeah. democracy, right? That's the thing. No matter how much you have, you can never have enough freedom for you, red-blooded Americans. I feel like if most people in America agree about something, suddenly a lot of people won't, just because people like to be <laughs> contrarian here. Yes, but I mean, but my point is, look at the other countries. For example, United Kingdom, it's about forty percent ish. And France is about forty-three percent ish. That、so、they、I、want more democracy. They want demo- more democracy.、Okay. So I feel like it's almost like it, that number is saying to me. Yeah. Well, that kind of would sort of mean you probably do have the right amount because if fifty percent people say you need more, fifty percent、mm-hmm. people probably say we have too much. Yeah. It means you're maybe somewhere. Forty sixty is a is a land is a landslide. Yeah. Yeah. This is something we have to learn. I had to learn. When asked about whether people think their leaders are selected by free and fair elections, yeah, only seventeen percent in China said China did not hold free and fair elections. <laughs> only seven percent in China said China has no freedom of speech. <laughs> so you know, definite minority here who <laughs> thinks that China does not have free or fair. But、elections. I mean, this is just made up, essentially, right? Obviously, everybody in China knows you don't have freedom of speech. Well, yeah. Well, this is what they say to the survey. Your、though. your your posts get deleted on. I know. Weibo every day. I know. Like, so so I'm presenting these not as facts of how China is. Yes. But what Chinese people say about China. What the, what the party when asked a certain way. So, so this is the party line. Yes. Exactly.、Okay. And comparatively speaking, thirty three percent of Americans said that their country. Do not hold free and fair elections, <laughs> thanks to Donald Trump.、Yeah. You know,、um, some of those people could be people on the left who are saying like Republicans are. Oh,、know. that's true. I take、right? it back. Right.、So, I mean, it could be、that's、both、true. sides, right? That's very right. Yeah.、Um, free speech in America. Yeah. Thirty-one percent said no. 
Maybe Ever since they, they, Donald Trump I got think, kicked off Twitter, Jerry. I bet you Proud Boys will be like, there is not enough free speech. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry. One more stats. Okay. Yeah. About 63% in the U.S. said that the U.S. government mainly serves the interest of a minority only, which is, you know, I get it. But guess the percentage of people who say that in China? 7%. <laughs> Single digits. So what's my point after this long rant of yeah. why I'm unhappy about <laughs> this study? A study like this, just presenting these results as if they're facts in many ways, mm -hmm. even though they add little asterisks here and there and explain, oh, some countries, the government takes an active role in shaping public opinion, yeah. which is very mild language, by the way, right? Yeah. They're like they're trying not to get into trouble with yeah. the Chinese government, basically, I feel like. I mean, a study like that, yeah. I know that the study for studying democracy is actively bad for democracy. Oh, because, exactly. That's because my it's, point. Because yeah. it's presenting these things to a credulous worldwide audience. Yeah. Like, oh, Chinese people are all really happy. Because then other people, I actually have seen that study listed before without the asterisk, right? Newsweek or something just Well, just Newsweek it. comes up. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so because Newsweek reported on this report, on this study yeah and the um the title the subject of the article was quote most in china call their nation a democracy most in u.s say america isn't quote yeah when in reality a thousand possibly paid chinese internet yeah trolls think china's a democracy right? exactly so it has credibility <laughs> the study like this it has exposure yeah right and without enough context yeah and i will give them some credit it's all about giving credit for me <laughs> um to this you know the, the, the privileged danes. yeah the, 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 <laughs> the danes yeah the d-a-n-e-s yeah yeah danish people denmark the Danes. oh i guess they're the danes yeah, <laughs> yeah. also germany-based oh, data okay. company the Europeans, you know, they, um, the Northmen, the living, the, the ones that are living the good life now. Well, I don't know. I, mean, I guess with Russia and, and Ukraine, not really, not so much. But my point is they did list Taiwan as a country in basically all pages. Mm. You know, they did a separate survey for it. And one of the most, I think maybe shocking, the takeaways that really got highlighted is that lots of people from lots of other countries say yeah. that they support their countries in cutting ties with China if mm. China invades Taiwan. Mm. So they did list that in there. So I'm guessing that this report will not get published in China anyways. So in that article from Newsweek, a Latana political research consultant, the company that published this report, yeah. said, quote, the eagerness displayed by those in single party led nations such as China and Vietnam to describe their country as democratic may perhaps be a function of not wanting to speak out against the government. But, he argued, <laughs> it could also be a real perception that their country is somehow acting in the interests of many people. And this is what democracy means, quote. That isn't actually what democracy and, yeah, means. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So let me read my lines. I wrote, but is it? <laughs> Is this what democracy means? Latana, political research consultant? I'm sure he was trying to be fair. But, yeah. you know, my outrage goes back to why we're making this episode. And I guess now we're starting this episode yeah. some 10 minutes later of my ranting. So, tradition. What does democracy mean? Children's version. The word democracy comes from Greek words. Demos, meaning people. Mm -hmm. And kratos, meaning power. Yeah. So, quite literally, power of the people power to the people it doesn't mean it has to act in the people's interests no right everyone can vote to screw themselves over also the definition of people's interest it varies yeah it, who's to say what's the best for people what does best mean mm -hmm. which is a revelation i had came to which we'll talk about <laughs> in recent years yeah um but in short is that in a democracy as voters you have the total rights doesn't mean you should but you have the total rights to mess your country up. <laughs> yeah. If there's... you think global warming is fake or whatever, <laughs> right? Like, and you think that's best for you. Yeah. You're wrong. But, <laughs> but the, the definition of democracy is that no one can overwrite your vote. Yeah. Yeah. But you still should not vote against <laughs> environmental measures. So, <laughs> so in Chinese, democracy translates to minzhu. Meaning, the people makes the decisions. Okay. Obviously, we know, or at least you and I sitting in this room, and maybe our cat, 
knows that China is not a democracy. Yeah. But if you read this report, it's like, wait, is China a democracy? If you don't really know much about China yeah. today, right? And and if you and obviously there's going to be a dozen tankies who will pop onto a, a Twitter feed and go, no, no, China's a democracy. You just don't understand it, right? Yeah, exactly. It just as a side note, the word Minchu, democracy, and different variations of it, even the acronym MZ, are quite often censored on Chinese social media. <laughs> so to the tankies, this is what I'll say. And obviously, there are many forms and systems of democracy. Yeah. But in all of them, the real ones anyways, free and fair elections are essential. Yeah. Right? Is that a controversial statement? No, you have to okay. have elections, right? That's not what the Latana political research consultant said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we're going to talk about elections in China. The PRC's constitution does say the Chinese government is a people's democratic dictatorship. Well, I guess it is then. <laughs> and there are elections. Time, time to end the episode. I know. There are elections, even if they're all fake. And some people pretend to vote for some things at times, okay. right? Like President Eleven got voted into three terms. Three terms? Oh. Think bigger, okay? Oh, okay. You, you're limited by your imagination. <laughs> Such as in 2018, the National People's Congress, which is the legislative body of the Chinese government, like a parliament, mm. um, but not really because they do what they're told by the party. <laughs> this parliament voted to remove the two-term limit for presidency in China from the constitution. Mm. Meaning... President 11, President Xi. Pre Cherry and I often call President Xi Jinping President 11 because his name is, you know, XI, X X which is 11 in Roman numerals. Yeah, but. and lots of, honestly, lots of like Westerners don't pronounce this right. So it's like quite confusing sometimes. Oh. Yeah, President He, Xi. <laughs> okay, so meaning, pre I think I'm going to cut. Meaning, <laughs> keep it in. meaning, President Xi can and most likely will remain in power for life. Mm. And out of 2,964 votes, only two of the people's delegates voted no. Who are those two people? I, you know, right, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, here's just my wild guess. It's not like they were trying to make a stance. It's not like they're the lone wolf. Like it's the not man. like they, people were trying to, they're, they're running up to push their vote and security was trying to hold them yeah. back. And they're like, no. Yeah, I think they just <laughs> handpicked two people. Like, you can vote no. <laughs> Because then we'll make it look like, you know, it's all rehearsed. Yeah. It's not like they're the lone man standing in front of like the, the <laughs> tank in the Tiananmen Square yeah. picture. So if you just look at that, and if you look at that report, you will say, oh, yeah, so the Chinese people did vote for him to become emperor. Just like Yuan Shikai did. Yeah. Just like the Chinese people did Yuan Shikai, I guess. Yeah. So, you know. Watch our, listen to our episodes on Yuan Shikai. Yeah. So we're not here to say China does not have elections. Yeah. But China does not have free and fair elections. And there is a history to it. While it is reactionary for me to push back on this, uh, you know me, I'm always like, let's not look at, you know, let's not look deeper into Chinese political systems. Why are we giving them legitimacy? Yeah. And part of me just wants to scream that it's all just a big lie. <laughs> but the reality is the world runs on lies a lot of the times. Mm. More nicely put, Deceptions, at least, right? Yeah. And there are deceivers and the willfully deceived. What other choice do you have if not to try and deconstruct the lies and the deception in order to defeat it? Mm. I just realized when I said the world runs on lies, I sound like a conspiracy like person. No, I think, like, for example, money. Money's a lie, right? It's just, it's just paper, right? We believe it means something. That's true. Okay, so you have to have your faith in the story. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah, okay. The world runs on storytelling. How about that? That sounds yeah, better. I mean, but, yeah. you know, it runs on constructions. Right. Okay. Right? Yeah. Something, this belongs to me, that belongs to you. Yeah. Like, Some constructions are harmful, though. Yeah. So even though I don't want anyone who lent legitimacy to something that is cruel and, and dark and, and, and just so much where my personal anxiety and problems come I know, from. But people don't understand it. I they, know. Yeah. The reality, it's not enough to just point out that the emperor has no clothes on. Yeah. It's, you need more steps than that, <laughs> you know? And the reality is more complicated. So to defeat a lie or the lie or many lies that, you know, web together is an arduous, multi-step process and sometimes quite hopeless. But, you know, you got to try. 
Also, there are people who want to believe in the lie, understandably, mm-hmm. and are comforted by the lie. Too. Yeah. So we are going to look at the lie, basically, and we're going to try to deconstruct it. And it's history. I mean, I this think, is still a history podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I don't, I think it's comforting probably to some people. You don't want to believe that your government has no, that you have no ability to affect anything that happens to you. Which you don't. No. Yeah. Don't. It might be very, very hard to get by day to day. Yeah. If you hold that belief and the glass is shattered. Yeah. The glass, the bubble, the bubble is shattered. Yeah. Delusion. The delusion is shattered. So, so this episode comes to be elections with Chinese characteristics. Now we can enter the episode. <laughs> <laughs> so the concept of modern democracy was introduced into China in the mid 19th century. Mm. In 1841, when a British iron warship sank a Chinese fleet during the First Opium War, we've done episodes on this. Yeah, there was a crisis of confidence, and the Qing court had finally taken an interest in European politi- political systems and ideas.、Mm. And when I say the Qing court, I mean some part of the Qing court. Yeah. And they had to invent new words for the Western systems of elections and things around it. Yeah. And first, they called elections "gongju," meaning public appointment. You know, kind of makes sense, appointed by the public. Yeah. And the idea, though, was that by saying that, it sort of emphasizes it's not a competitive system, or like they don't want it to be a competitive system.、Mm. Yeah. Appointment. Not a competition, but you select someone. Everyone agrees. Of course, the state guides the decision and has veto power. It's almost like the civil service exam. Yeah, kind of viewing it as exactly.、Um, and later, the word was changed to 选举 which means select and recommend for higher office, which is slightly more accurate. You know,、mm. there's a selection process by whom, still not clear.、Um, which is, but this is the word that we use today in Chinese for elections:、mm. 选举 And there were two sides of opinions when this concept had entered into China, as the court officials familiarized themselves with how did the Great Britain become so powerful. Well, also I think it's probably there, you know, because you're going to have different years, different people come, and you know, like the government in the UK will have changed, right? And、yeah. so people will they'll be like, who are we dealing with? Yeah, who? You know? Yeah, why did why do they now want to do this instead、yeah. of that? And so you kind of have to understand it. Yeah. So they did do that, which is. Good for them, but、mm. a little late. But you know, <laughs> better later than ne- ne- never.、Um, there were two sides of opinion. A lot of them thought positively of democracies and elections, and they even explored possibilities of establishing a system where the Qing court can tap into an overlooked talent pool to allow several million of these lower-level civil service examination degree holders、mm. to participate in politics. Okay, and this is an interesting group of people, because it's not like they stop after getting the lowest level of the degree. They just they can't. They're basically unable to get through the higher examination,、mm. therefore to get a job in the bureaucratic system. Or they don't have enough bribe money. Oh, they don't have enough bribe money. Yes, exactly. So you know, so this is a, a sort of like the failed songs of the <laughs> of the. Of China, and、yeah. but there's a lot of them, yeah, and they're just not in a position to go around. But they are literate, right?、Yeah. They they know how to read, they know how to write, they have a certain level of knowledge of how the government works. And they probably come from a decent family. They yeah, they wouldn't be like peasants most of the time. So this would be like halfway between like a legislature and like an elect and like a electorate. Yes, exactly. So you know they're educated. Yeah, but they they're jobless. Yeah, they're 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 unemployed. So young men unemployed fail songs. Yeah, you know start revolutions apparently. But in this case, they they are they're potential troublemakers. Yeah, you know the the court officials thought, okay, so we have several millions of them here, and why don't we have them contribute to politics?、Mm. Again, this is not universal suffrage. We're a long way from that. Yeah, but at least they're allowing, I guess, failed songs men to participate. This is almost closer to like. The start of it, like in England, where you have like the nobles all get together, yes, right, and、exactly. decide whether the king gets more taxes or not. Yes. So this proposal would keep them close to the state and give them a feeling that they're included. <laughs> Participation ribbon. You know, and they can establish some sort of a election voting system and communication channels 
so that it can this process can strengthen the state. So I don't think they ever implemented it, but they played with the idea. Mm. And it was, you know, papers were written, proposals proposals were written, which is how we know about this today. Yeah. What's more interesting to me was that on the contrary to Western democracies, the focus was not on improving people's lives or hearing their voices yeah. or like giving them citizens rights. It was about how do we strengthen the state? Mm. You know, how could they defeat us? How do we get better as a state? How do we get really get stronger in like external struggles? How do we get better ideas? How are we more unified? Yes. Once again, some may say, oh, that's the best interest of the people, a strong state. But if you really think about it, it's a complete reversal of ideas. Yeah. So, yeah. So to me, that's basically the fundamental difference between the Western style elections and democracies and this Chinese thinking of it. Early on. Early on. Well, it's stuck. So, okay. which is why I thought, you know, if it only just stayed around for a while, then we don't need to mention mm. it. But I think it left a quite a heavy mark in history. It's not about the people having the right to choose. The elections don't serve the citizens. They serve the state. It's a tool for top down communication and a way to strengthen the state and to wake up the sleeping dragon. Mm. Yeah. At the same time, of course, there were some naysayers. Yeah. about introducing this idea and the tapping to this talent pool, giving people opportunities to speak up. These were negative Nathans. <laughs> the negative Nathans? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I didn't invent it. If you Google it. <laughs> well, they are all going to be dudes. Sure. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I yeah. didn't want to say, you know, I feel like the Karens, the Nancys, I feel like that's too mean on women. You know, yeah. I feel like that's misogynist. Especially because yeah. I'm sure this story is going to be a sausage fest. Oh, it's a sausage fest. <laughs> so, so, so starting now, when I'm never going to say negative Nancy's, I'm going to say negative Nathan's. <laughs> <laughs> Reclaiming it for Reclaim- the Nancy's of the world. <laughs> exactly. So the popular opinion of this negative Nathan's, this can lead to partisanship. This can lead to corruption. Elections and democracies are a waste of money and time. <laughs> it's too chaotic. It's too volatile. It's da, 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 da. <laughs> Which, you know, there's some reasons to it. Sure. Yeah. Around this time, from debates about democracies and elections and the West, the self-strengthening movement was initialized. Mm. But the reforms didn't go far beyond industrial, economic, and military modernization. Social reforms weren't really on the table. Political reforms, not on the table. Yeah, it's basically how can we be Imperial China, but with machine guns. Yeah, exactly. To be fair, China did make significant modernization progress if you compare to what modernization progress China had made years before that, which mm-hmm. was zero. You know, <laughs> So from zero to one, that's a lot. Railways were built, telegraph lines were built, etc., etc. But it ended with the first Sino-Japanese war. We all know how it went. Yeah. Um, Japan defeated China. And then after that defeat in 1895, more reformists started to emphasize on institutional reform. Well, because Japan had taken some of these reforms like yeah institution japan exactly. had a legislator legislature had votes and yeah. had all that stuff so they got a lot of ideas from japan because it's not just the western states now yeah japan's right there we obviously feel closer and we feel, feel superior. like superior <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know but it's it's almost like there is a cultural closeness, and so it's almost like some reformers thought if they could do it, yeah, they use kanji. I don't know, like you know, why can't we do it? <laughs> they know? have chopsticks, they, they have right? Chops- yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so they started emphasizing on institutional reform, such as establishing a parliament, and some even uh, pushed for a constitutional monarchy I- ideas, right? Yeah, and of course, Sushi shut that down. She's you know like, who, no. Do you know why Sushi shut it down? They let. Ren Shikai in on their plans. They're like, Ren Shikai, you've got an army. Oh, yeah, he you gotta, told her. You gotta help us. Yeah. And, and Ren Shikai's like, uh, and then he told Sushi. And he snitched. He crushed it all. I know. Ren Shikai is gonna come up a few times yeah. in this episode. I never thought I would go to, I've never given Ren Shikai much thought <laughs> for the first like 25 years of my life. No, and in the past few years, it's all Ren Shikai. <laughs> it's just everywhere. Okay. So. <laughs> They eventually made some progress at the end of the Qing Dynasty. Hmm. Election laws were written for a provincial assemblies from 1909 to 1911. That's the term they would serve. Yeah. And even though these elections turned out to be generally free, fair, and competitive and <laughs> unsupervised, only a small percentage of the population participated, and almost everyone elected was men from the gentry class. Yeah. But it was all too little and too late. In 1912... The Qing government was overthrown and the Republic of China was established. Mm -hmm. And the following few years, 
Yes, there were elections of a parliament, such as Yuan Shikai was elected to be president. Yeah. Um, and later elected to be the emperor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you know, let's just be honest here. Really, those elections were results of negotiations, power struggles, bribery, and yeah. coercion. <laughs> yeah. All the good things you want in a in a in a democracy. And one of the first big elections when somebody, I think it was they they won the prime ministership. Mm -hmm. They were KMT party when Ren Shikai yeah. didn't like the KMT, and he, the guy just got assassinated. Yeah, you mean Ren Shikai just assassinated him? Allegedly, he never admitted. To <laughs> he might have just gotten assassinated by some random person, Jerry. Who knows? Why would they do that? I don't know. Maybe they had a beef with them. <laughs> do people assassinate people for fun now? <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. 1914 in China. Okay, sure. So those years, elections were, you know, muddy waters. But I think for the sake of it, I want to dive into it mm. on how it worked in the early days of the Republic, or at least how it was supposed to work. Because, because that's I find kind it of interesting. almost some of the closest they got, though, because they did mm -hmm, get yeah. representatives from all over the country. Well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, first of all, it was a bicameral system, mm. meaning there are two separate assemblies, national assemblies. Think of it as the equivalent of Senate. And the Congress in America, yeah, almost the House and the Senate. The House and the Senate, um, you know, and they were meant to represent re regional political interests. The higher assembly, mm -hmm. every province's own assembly can elect their own senator. In this okay. case, supposedly the province's assembly was elected by the people. That's kind of how it worked in the U.S. before too. Yeah, but really, when I try to look into the regional laws of how the people who elect the senators are elected, yeah. it's like very unofficial. And really, lots of provinces were left to their own devices. Yeah. So no central supervision or laws, which in those years just means whoever is the most powerful person Yeah. and rich, richest men or warlords. And there are several special regions. Presumably, they didn't have local assemblies. Mongolia, Tibet, and Qinghai had their own election committee and these committees can select their own senators too hmm. this senate is supposed to have 274 slots six spots were reserved for overseas chinese affairs council hmm. this is just well, that's a big money block right there because that's so much money came back from overseas chinese exactly well lots of talent came yeah. back from yeah so this organization the continuous body of it still exists today and it's based in taiwan and it had it has been renamed to Overseas Community Affairs Council to avoid confusion to modern-day PRC. Mm. Because you hear Overseas Chinese Affairs Council, you think the CCP. But <laughs> the PRC also has its own Overseas Chinese Affairs Council as part of the National People's Assembly. And this Overseas Chinese Affairs Council was established in 1983, and they get 35 spots on the People's National People's Assembly it's in like China. Nine, it's like 1,900 people, isn't it? Like 2,900, I think. Oh, 2,900, okay. Why this is interesting to me is that we think of China as a closed country. Yeah. But maybe maybe the opposite way is not, is not to think of it as an open country, but how the Chinese culture and the political bodies have always tried to grasp on to its overseas people. Yeah. Maybe our listeners can tell us, because I don't know much about other countries' systems. Like, if you're a French person, and if you have immigrated to e England or something, and your children are, are grow up in England, aren't they just British? Does France have a committee to <laughs> reach out to the children well, I who, think, are, who are French descendants all over the world? Well, I think, well, Israel does. But... Um, well, but Israel is a... A special case. Yeah, I think... Um, This part of this goes back all the way to our first episode about the Q and mm -hmm. that I think historically China has always felt threatened mm. by Chinese people going abroad yeah. and then not identifying as part of nationality as, nationality a, Chinese person, as a Chinese person, which has always happened which and is, they can't stop it. Yeah, This yeah. is just what happens. So whether it's yeah. making everybody wear the Q wherever you go, forbidding people to leave, you know, or trying to create these legislative things to be like no no yeah yeah you're living in america but really you're still really part, you're chinese really you're chinese you're part yeah. of china you can't forget your roots you got to vote back here yeah no taxation with the representation <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know? yeah yeah so so i find that interesting which i don't think is the case an american person today if their children becomes well i don't know icelander or or, or go to africa and lives there no they, america doesn't claim them for china though generations removed yeah china will try to claim you oh yeah <laughs> yeah And another thing that caught my eye was that there are eight spots reserved for a central educational committee. 
which was going to be a new group of intellectuals um, that's under the National Education Department. But the committee was never established, so I guess they just let that go. And I wanted to mention these because it's very interesting to see who was considered to be worthy of representation here. Mm. And not to give the republic too much credit, even though these elections were turned out to be not nearly as clean as you would hope them to be, and even though the election process was chaotic and full of confusion, violence, bribery, but a structure like this and a process like this was unheard of in China. Mm -hmm. This is what the reformists was trying to do for the longest time, and people lost their heads over it. Um, it was many steps forward because think about maybe 50 years ago in the Qing dynasty, in the Qing court in Beijing, they didn't care anything about having officials from every province to to represent the voice. No, the most they did. They didn't the, even care about having Han people. No, they did. <laughs> the most I looked it up. Yeah, I was like the Qing central central court. Yeah. What's the compos you know com composition? Yeah. The, how does the different departments select their officials? Yeah. And um, for some positions, they did make sure to have Han people take them. And or at least there needs to be a ratio of there's a lot of Mong Mongolians, too, by the way. Oh, yeah. Cause yeah. Because they're, they're brothers. We can trust them. Yeah, exactly. So there were so there were positions reserved for Han people or they're like, we need to have four Han officials uh, in this department and four Mongolians. Diversity requirements. And exactly. You know, so they're like, it won't all be Manchurians. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> But that's the most they did for representation, mm -hmm. right? The, no consideration of regional interests and voices. So, so this is why I wanted to mention it. Mm. And ever since that, you know, it, it just seemed really hard to go back to having an emperor. Yeah. Although a hundred years later, I don't know. I don't want to say. <laughs> I don't want to be too optimistic. Also, Yuan Shikai too. Yeah. <laughs> no, but <laughs> he was voted Yuan emperor. Is this. He was voted to oh. be a constitutional monarch. Cherry. My God. Like a monarch is not voted in. It's a God-given <laughs> right. Like, that's by nature. It doesn't make sense. It's like sense. the Queen of England, Sherry. <laughs> yeah, she was voted in for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, the, the lower court. The representatives are elected locally. And according to each province's population, they get, you know, a certain number of representatives. Mm. Uh, minimally speaking, though, each province gets 10. So totally, there would be 596 congressmen. And yes, congressmen. Yeah. Not any other types of people. <laughs> um, and there are laws in terms of who can be elected. First, man. Did I say that enough? <laughs> Second, you have to be over 21 to be a congressman, over 25 to be the equivalent of a senator. Okay. You have to live, have lived two years in an election district. You have to meet one of the three conditions below, which there, this is a real killer of <laughs> most of people who cannot be elected ever. A, you have to pay two RMB in taxes yearly. Okay. Two RMB worth a lot. Um, in this time period. In this time period, yeah. Okay. And you have to have above 500 RMB in assets. And you have uh, to have graduated from elementary school. So this bars most people <laughs> from, from ever being elected mm. or participating and running for office. So, so that was the system. But not everyone was on board. Again, we have negative Nathans. <laughs> one, one popular opinion was that, and I quote an article from the Shangbao, uh, a newspaper at the time, in 1914, talking about the Jiangsu local election. Quote, given the level of the people in today's China, it is impossible to expect a good result from elections. So they're like, the people are too un undereducated. And there were indeed all sorts of problems with fraud, extortion, violence, which I think I've said these words too many times in this episode. Yeah. Um, but for example, in Wuxi, which, uh, you know, a city in Jiangsu province, I think, one citizen alleged that, quote, a local leader had taken home a large number of ballots before the July 1st primary stage election, hired people to fill them out, and then attempted to cast all of them on election day. <laughs> This person lost some of the ballots on the way to the polling station, though, <laughs> which were then found and his plot exposed. <laughs> Quote. So, you know, poorly executed. We got some, we got some uh, investigative journalism going on. Exactly. <laughs> so this was from a newspaper and it was in 1921. Another newspaper at the time stated, Quote, they should just, quote, give the price of elected officials to the person who spends the most money. Quote. <laughs> 
And one writer in a Suzhou newspaper suggested that the government select future legislators through a lottery, and the money raised could be a revenue stream for the government. <laughs> so people were quite cynical about it. You can see it through these comments, and I, I'm not even sure if the last one was ironic or not.、Mm. But despite all of these opinions, comments, complaints, an elected National Assembly was seated in Nanjing at the、mm. early、uh, in, at the establishment yeah, of the Republic. Republic. A new age ushered in China, but this by no means did the job of convincing people, the Chinese people, that voting and elections could be a reliable way to select talent for the state.、Mm. Because of these problems that we have mentioned, so you can't blame people who think that, right? Because the way the laws were designed, same as before, it was fundamentally not about citizens having rights. Well, also, I think you've got an entire industry and group of people who. Built their life around the civil service exams and that sort of thing as selecting、mm-hmm. talent. Yeah, and now they got to like go out there and like campaign, or... <laughs> which is a whole different set of skills. <laughs> yeah, whole different set of skills. Yeah, not much overlap. No. Yeah, how did Obama do it? I don't know, Sherry. He reads books and he's good at public speaking. <laughs> Sometimes、yeah. you're just a hero character. <laughs> Sometimes you Sometimes are. Sometimes you just have more stats than the other people. Yes. So um. It was about state. How the state can use this opportunity to strengthen, you know, its link to the public, to educate the public, to enlighten them. Or it was about Yuan Shikai getting to be emperor. That's what the laws were designed <laughs> for. Wearing the cool robes and the hat. And in 1920s, the government doubled down on this. They released new election laws and effectively implemented a single candidate system, which means there can be no more real competitions in these elections. Because, because I mean, I think at a certain point, yeah. The provinces are all taken over by warlords. Yeah, and then they couldn't do it anyways. Yeah, and yeah. then so the KMT is not going to do all the work to、yeah. crush all these warlords and then let some other party get elected. Yeah. So in the 1920s, 30s, several adjustments of the election law were all sort of like going, trying to solve this problem or、yeah. going around it.、Um, and ironically, though, I think people who designed these laws probably didn't think it was a cynical effort. They thought this is what's best for China. They were wrong, of course. <laughs> For example, one big name I want to mention here was this very famous scholar who returned to China in 1917, having been educated by Cornell and Columbia University. He came back to China with the mission to reshape national culture. This、um, is like white savior, but it's like but Chinese white educated Chinese savior. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he did not want to.、Uh, he did not wait to participate in political work. He was big on. Placing the emphasis on education front and center when it comes to elections, which was not controversial, by the way.、Mm. What a safe, you know, stance to take in China.、Um, he proposed many different things, of course, such as demobilizing warlord armies. <laughs> We all want to do that, Hu Shi, though. You know, the problem is, why don't you tell us how? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He <laughs> you should just not let the warlords have soldiers. Yeah. Oh, thanks, buddy. That's a real good idea. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll get right on that. He wanted to call for a national peace conference, but most importantly,、uh, he urged that there needs to be a reform of the current election system. Okay, so he's an ideas guy. He is an ideas guy. Those intellectuals, you know. Yeah. This means adoption of direct elections. He wanted. He wanted tough, tough laws against fraud. And to reduce the size of the national and provincial legislatures, he's like it's too oversaturated.、Mm. Which I mean, I agree in theory. Those are you know? good things on paper. I mean,、yeah. the warlord shouldn't have troops.、I、you、know. should have better elections. I know. And of course, other people back in China for years have proposed these things. But who was the big name that finally brought some attention and noise?、Uh, so he said this about the educational purpose of elections. Quote: We must recognize that democratic institutions are. An important instrument for the training of good citizens. Quote. And my problem was was this is that he st- still got it backwards. He referred to the slow development of representative government in the Great Britain,、mm-hmm. and he mentioned that he had observed elections in the United States twice <laughs> in 1912 and 1916 in the presidential elections,、mm. uh, and Woodrow Wilson won both times. He visited the polls during the presidential election. And he said this about his observations: "Quote, I purposefully picked voters who did not appear to be upper class, people chewing tobaccos, or with foreign accents." <laughs> Can you sense my anger? <laughs> 
Um, you know, I don't think it might be too much to ask for the the rich Chinese intellectual <laughs> in nineteen like twenty five to be like woke about. Yeah, I know. And was shocked that they all were able to offer detailed explanations of the items on the ballot. Did these tobacco chewing, foreign accented American <laughs> voters need to read a political science textbook? They were simply born under a Republican system and grew up in a democratic environment. Because they experienced the training of the system, they naturally acquired the knowledge that citizens of many democratic countries need to have. And as a result, were much more enlightened than those of us who have learned about politics through reading at universities. Mm. Sounds like Mao there. But... <laughs> So kind of saying you got to fake it till you make it. We got to... Yes. The takeaway was that you practice by doing. Mm. You give people the opportunity to be good citizens through practicing. And at the time, it was quite radically, really. Because he also said in 1922, popular politics itself is a kind of citizen education. Give someone a ballot and he might go sell it today. <laughs> but someday in the future, this person will not be willing to sell it. <laughs> if you never give that person a ballot, there will be no chance to sell it now, but also no chance in the future not to sell it. Mm. So, you know, he's like, it's okay if they sell it. <laughs> we got to start somewhere. He's like, you got to do a democracy with the people you have. Yeah, exactly. So this is contrary to the, you know, the newspaper that complained, oh, people just aren't good enough. Like, what kind of candidates would they elect today? Yeah. Terrible ones. But he's like, that's fine. So, you know, I, I like him for that, I guess. It's something. So efforts were made here and there. Although all these big ideas failed to achieve the goal he had wanted. Mm. And it's not just the fault of, like, some of these ideas are unachievable. For example, simply telling the warlords to decommission their armies <laughs> or like, you know, to demobilize them. Um, because it's just, it's not like it was a stable country. Yeah. Or anything. There was a loss of faith in the country's government all the time. Yeah. There was a slow loss of faith of the constitution, right? Mm. Thanks to Yuan Shikai <laughs> for that. Um, there were all these warlords staring down at the neck of the central government. Uh, All also, the there time. Was, there was a loss of sovereignty. There was a loss of sovereignty. Uh, from foreign countries. From foreign in. countries. The Japanese. Yeah. And then the Civil War. You know, so China had very chaotic years. So this is not to say that efforts weren't made. Actually, quite of them made locally and centrally. They just weren't successful. And even the mere purpose to educate people, let alone actually rely on elections to choose reliable, successful leaders, were failing. Because in order to educate, a deep sense of purpose and broad participation needs to happen. Mm. And, but you can't really find that in China at this time. No. Yeah. So that, unfortunately, ends the episode today, which does not paint a pretty picture of Chinese elections. Mm. And let me tell you, the next episode is going to paint an uglier picture even. <laughs> so, so, but I think it's useful to think about, to, to look back on how China had understood elections and its purpose from the beginning because this even though china china is a new china you know but that line of thought has continued even to today yeah so we will see how the prc are going to utilize that thought how the prc are going to practice it with the core value of the elections are a tool for the state not a tool for citizens to practice their rights. Well, I, I think it's an interesting thing because, I, I, you know, fundamentally, I guess the Western track for democracy or, or for a republic, right? Maybe not a democracy, but how you go from a autocracy to a representative government would be something like if in the warlord period, mm -hmm. they were just like, okay, every warlord gets X number of representatives. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you know, that we're going to come in and make decisions. And if we all agree, yeah. you know, but like there's that still that inability for the central government mm -hmm. to not have complete control. Yeah. Right. Um, exactly. You know, when the 13 colonies came together, right. You know, each colony still kind of had a military, still had its own authority in a way. And then they, they voluntarily kind yeah. of gave some up to be part of something part of larger. Right. Yeah. The, you know, I don't know. The Magna Carta was 
the nobles essentially yeah. asserting that they had certain rights in yeah. in England. But like, you know, the answer in China, yeah, was just that we okay, we just gotta we gotta have some elections, you know, to keep the foreigners off our backs. To, yeah. You know, make people feel like they're involved, yeah. and meanwhile, we're gonna crush every other power group. Exactly. In China. We're still they're gonna be the sole power group. <laughs> yeah. Just how do we make this power power block stronger? Yeah. And a firmer grasp on power. Mm. Next time, if a tanky says China has elections, well, we don't know yet because they're gonna say. Oh, no, that's no. true. So that's next true. week, what are we gonna talk yeah. about? Communist elections. Yes, we are. Okay, so we're gonna we get to talk a lot about Mao. Yeah. Well, communist elections are very, I'll just give you a preview. They're massive. Mm. I will say the participation rate, quite good. <laughs> but not to select a candidate, though, to prove that they're good members of the mm. state. You well, know? the book that you mentioned, Voting as a Right, it's mm-hmm. not voting as an R I T E. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, right. that was important. It's R I T E. Vo- right, like a religious right. Yes. You know, and I, I, this episode might be for, I don't know who the audience would, like the targeted <laughs> audiences are, because I've mentioned it to a few of my Chinese friends. Yeah. And they're like, oh, what are you reading? And I'm like, this is the book. And uh, they're like, oh, what does that mean? Like, right. Because I didn't know what the word right mean, mm. R-I-T-E. And I was like, oh, you know, it's just like a, what do you said? Like a. Like a ceremony. Like a ceremony. Like a, like a, for show, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it might be interesting for you if even if you didn't know that um, to to know the ins and outs of it. Yeah. So this is the this is the framework. This is the origin mm. of democracy in China, or of quote unquote mm. democracy in China. Yeah. And then next week we're going to talk about communist democracy and also yeah modern Chinese. Yeah, we're going to talk a uh, lot about class dictatorship, <laughs> which is a word that I do not wish I have studied, <laughs> but somehow it fills my brain. <laughs> this is what I use my brain power for nowadays. <laughs> Learning about Mao. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, this is it, I guess. We will see you in the next episode. Yep. I think next episode is going to be finishing up on the Opium War. Yeah. Or the Arrow War, I guess. At the Arrow War. And yeah. then more. Uh, and the one after that will be the second part of this episode. Yeah. And then I think I'm going to do an episode on the Little Red Book. So. Oh. Ooh. Look forward to that. Challenging. I mean, fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the Little Red Book is that challenging. It's fairly digestible. Uh, emotionally challenging for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, I, I, I do think like, because we all know about it, right? Everyone knows about it. Yeah. And then... It's worth actually talking about what is in it, though. Yeah. Because it so was popular what? here, too, in the U.S. It was popular in Europe. It was popular in Africa. Oh, pop- yeah. Right? It wasn't... It wasn't just a Chinese thing. There's people... In South America, there's people... I can't tell you how many, like... There's all these, like, like hippies... Yeah. And like communist believers and then they hold the right book little red book and they're like we need a permanent revolution i'm like ah, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about bro <laughs> it's always like a and even in um even in the west wing my favorite tv show <laughs> still i have reaffirmed my believing it um i had a crisis of confidence in myself and the show went under drama was elected <laughs> um but uh, what was i gonna say yeah, so in it, I don't know how many of you are West Wing fans, <laughs> if you remember <laughs> this, but I do. So uh, uh, the speechwriter, Sam Seaborn, for President Bartlett was like upset that some like legislation they'd have done for like education and like teachers yeah. were like like a half-assed job. Yeah. Right? It was a compromise, a result of partisanship and stuff. Yeah. And he's like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Milk toast. He didn't say milk toast. That's a re- new word, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You know why are we doing this? You know we need we need a permanent revolution. We need to actually do something here. Yeah. And then the other guy was like, "We're quoting the little red book now. You want to be careful about that." <laughs> <laughs> and then I think they said something about how do you think the communists got everyone to be communists? You know, you need good writing. So we well, also need brainwashing camps which yeah is, which no, we exactly. you need about, both you need both yeah. <laughs> which we talked about in the brainwashing episode yes so we're gonna look into the writing though in your episode about mm-hmm. the little red book all right well yeah. uh thank you for listening everyone thank you for listening to cherry's ranting as she gets it's basically a therapy session for me at this 30 point. years of repressed <laughs> feelings 30 about, years of her chest yeah okay see well, you next time see you next time bye-bye bye